Hi guys and welcome back to the Bird Photography Show with Glenn Bartley. Hello! And me, Jan Wegener. Thank you guys so much for watching all the past episodes and supporting the show by liking it, sharing it with your friends, commenting on the videos. And for those of you who have bought us a coffee on our little coffee program down there, we really appreciate it. Totally. Thanks so much, guys. We appreciate all your support in whatever form you can support us. And today we picked a very interesting topic, the most essential elements that help you to create amazing bird images. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes it's good to break something down to like its component parts and think about what you're actually trying to do in order to then achieve those great results. So why don't we get right into it with our first essential element, which is pretty obvious, it's gonna be the exposure. Obviously, if you're gonna take beautiful bird photos, you have to expose them properly. It's so important. And in order to do that, the most important thing, to be honest, is to understand the ISO, the shutter speed, and the aperture. Quite interesting, isn't it? Because it doesn't sound like such a difficult thing to just change three little settings on your camera, but then in the field, it's not always that easy because with changing light, we might have sun, shade, or you walk around and it goes from the shade to the sun. So actually staying on top of these settings and using the histogram to check that these settings are right and the exposure is correct is quite important and a big part of your work in the field, or almost the most important part really, because when I walk around, first thing I think is, is my exposure correct before I even really start shooting? So it's a very important step. And there's many different ways to actually do that. There's full manual, there's sort of semi-manual, semi-automatic modes, and then there's fully automatic modes. But I think the more you progress in your career as a bird photographer, the more you want to lean towards the more manual side of things because it gives you a lot more control in the field. Personally, I'm a big fan of shooting in full manual, even if the light is changing, I just have to really stay on top of my camera and my settings. But with the R5 and the EVF that actually shows me my exposure and the histogram in the viewfinder, it's not that difficult anymore to keep your settings correct. I know that a lot of people find it a little bit more difficult, especially in sort of changing light conditions. What do you, Glenn? I think just because of the way I learned, the way I've started out, and because I tend to shoot in fairly challenging exposure scenarios in the understory and dappled light of the rainforest, I've always kind of leaned towards aperture priority mode as my go-to mode, and I use exposure compensation in order to dial in my exposure in the field. As you suggested though, you know, with the mirrorless cameras now, it's a huge advantage to have that, you know, viewfinder showing you what the exposure will be and even have your histogram there. And if I was starting out now, I probably would just shoot full manual, but my brain for the last 20 years has gotten used <laughs> to shooting aperture priority. So I don't know if I'll change necessarily, but anyways, there's more than one way to do it. What's important is that you have a, a good and quick way that you know how to control those variables in order to create a properly exposed image. There's another mode that a lot of people seem to be using these days that might even be a little bit easier to use in aperture priority and that's manual with the auto ISO. So you set your shutter speed, your aperture, and then you just let the camera decide on the ISO. So you basically then don't have to change anything while you're shooting more or less. So I mean, that's another Good option, but personally for me, I like control, so it's full manual, but as Glenn said, in the end, you should be using whichever mode is best for you and gives you the best results. And there's no right or wrong in the end, really. What we actually want to achieve in the field is a kind of nice and as even as possible photos, but that's also as bright as possible. So you want to expose as far to the right as possible in your histogram because that will definitely gives you the best image quality with the lowest noise in the images. If you are having a DSLR camera, the only thing to do that is with test shots. You go out, you photograph something that has a similar color to your bird, take a shot, check the histogram. Is it nice and far to the right without clipping anything? Good, then you're ready to go. For me, the main key takeaway would be check your histogram and make sure that you're exposing enough to the right. Yeah, and I would just add one more thing, which is just when you're in the field, is one thing that I find a lot of people tend to do is they're not thinking about the light on the subject and the background. If you have like a super sunny background, 
and then the bird is totally in the shade, you're gonna have a really hard time creating a properly exposed image. So what I always tell clients is look past the subject to the background and try to create a scenario where you have the same light on the subject in the background. So if the bird is in the sun, find a sunny background. If the bird is in the shade, find a shady background. And by doing that, you make your life so much easier. That's actually a very good point, Glenn, that there's certain lighting conditions that don't actually allow you to create a perfect exposure. And that's what's very important that we look at our second element, and that's actually the light. In bad light, in bad shooting conditions, it doesn't matter what settings you dial in, you're never gonna create a beautiful photo. The more and more you get into photography, you start understanding all these elements of light, and it is absolutely essential to, in order to be able to create beautiful bird photos to do that. So basically when it comes to light in the world of bird photography, we kind of more or less has three different types. We have direct sunlight, you know, like we said, the bird is in the sun, the background is in the sun, and typically we want the sun to be fairly low in the horizon in that situation. And the reason is, just like if I was wearing a baseball hat today, notice that I am not wearing a hat today, <laughs> but if, if the sun was right up above me at midday, I would have a massive shadow on my face and it would look horrible in the photo. So the same thing happens with birds. They get nasty shadows and it doesn't look very good. So we need direct low angle sunlight. Second type of light, of course. Jan, why don't you tell us the second type of light? And probably my favorite kind of light, nice and bright overcast. In a weird way, the easiest light to shoot in, but most people think it's not good at all. Because I think overall, it's a little bit trickier to work with the images because the images you're getting out of camera are quite flat and quite dull. So Editing them the right way is actually becoming a lot more important when you're shooting an overcast. But at the same time, it's so much easier because let's say you're in a forest, there's no shadows. You're in a forest with direct low sunlight. You have the worst shadows going all sorts of directions. It would actually be hard to find a window to shoot with the same light on the bird and the background. So beautiful soft overcast light can definitely help you to avoid shadows and actually will really help you to find the best angles on your bird as well because essentially you can do like a 360 around a bird that's sitting on a perch looking for the best background, the best light and overall personally I just think it's the best condition. Also because if you're on a trip for instance or you're traveling to a far distant country you can shoot all day. If I'm home and I can get some nice beautiful golden light, great. But anytime I'm flying somewhere to shoot or on a big road trip I am so stoked if it's just cloudy every day. But it's funny, like I definitely remember on the first like travel trip I went on, I went to Costa Rica for six months and I had like, I had, like some decent equipment and I remember I went to this one lodge and it was overcast and cloudy, kind of drizzly, light, light drizzle day. And there was this other photographer there and he was like, oh, this is like the first good day of light I'm getting. And I was like, what's this guy talking about? It's not even sunny. And I was like, totally fell into that trap of just like wanting to shoot in this you know, sunny light. Okay, so Jan, tell us, what is the third type of light that we might encounter as bird photographers or we might use? And some might say it's a little bit cheating, but I think we're introducing <laughs> artificial light to our scene. So we can use some nice fill flash that just helps us balance the scene. Because for instance, in the exposure in the beginning, Glenn was saying we might encounter a scene where we have a very bright background and a bird that's in the shade. And but just using the exposure settings in the camera, it will be impossible to balance that scene because if you're exposing for the bird, the background will be completely blown out. If you're exposing for the background, the bird will be dark. So you can actually introduce a little bit of fill flash, which is essentially using your flash just as a additional light source at a low power setting, just trying to balance your scene. So you're exposing for the background, making the background dark enough that it's not blown out. And then you're adding the light with the flash onto the bird. So now you're actually having a properly exposed background and a properly exposed bird. And I think that's one of the, or that's the main way that I use flash, but I know you've used it for instance for multi-flash setup for the hummingbirds as well. So is there any other ways you're using flash as well? Typically in nature photography, if we're gonna use flash, it's gonna be as a source of fill light. It's not the main source of light. And in fact, 
you're not even really changing those exposure settings, those parameters, the ISO shutter speed and aperture, those are staying the same. Yes. All you're doing is being able to help balance the light out. And that's really what we're doing. That's a huge thing. A lot of times people see you with this flash and you're like, wow, you're like lighting the whole scene up with that flash. And it's like, no, if you try to do that, it looks awful and super artificial. But the other thing that flash could help with sometimes is creative types of photography. So certainly when I do my hummingbird portfolios, um, I really, a great technique is to use multi-flash where you can really freeze the action. It can be a really fun and cool uh, photo shoot to do. And flash can also be used sometimes as a main source of light. So obviously anything at night, when you have no ambient light, you would need to use flash as the, the only source of light. But in saying all that, I must admit, I haven't <laughs> actually used the flash since I've gotten my R5 really. Like I just haven't. And there's a few reasons for that. I don't know how you feel about it, but for me, the main reason is that now the frame rates of the cameras are so fast that the flash cannot really keep up. That was always the main Achilles heel of using a flash is the recycling time. It just doesn't recycle fast enough. So you have a few images that are flashed and a few images that are not flashed. And typically the best image is always the one where it didn't fire. Yeah. So that was one of the big problems. That's why we carry big batteries around with the flash. And it was always a bit of a pain in the butt really. And now with having like 20 frames per second available, if you go into high speed mode, there's just no way the camera or the flash actually can keep up in any way. So I felt like I was getting significantly more unflashed images than flashed images. And the other thing is in the past, I felt like the main thing that disturbed the birds was the shutter sound. But now if I can shoot completely silent in electronic shutter mode with the R5, the one thing that can spook the bird now is actually the flash. So I've started to use it less. And when I used it less, I felt like that the image quality and the ability to pull up like darker areas on a bird is so good with the R5 files that I simply don't need it as much anymore. And if you guys want to know all about how to do an edit like this and how to edit your bird images to perfection, check out my masterclass and Glenn's ebook down there in the description. And there's a link up here somewhere as well. So check this out. <laughs> they will definitely help you with your editing. Phil Flash gave me a good advantage in the field, but it was never something you're looking forward to. You don't go out and you're like, yes, no. I can use Phil Flash again. It'd be more like, oh my God, I have to put this on, I have to put the flash on, I have to put the battery on, I have to plug in all the cords, and then I have to change the settings all the time. So it's not something that I really enjoyed doing. What do you think about flash? Are you still using it a lot, or has there been a change since using the mirrorless for you? So I got the R5 this spring, and I used flash a total of zero times. <laughs> so, <Okay. laughs> you know, it's, it's totally true. I mean, obviously I was on home turf, and I was picking the days I went out shooting carefully with appropriate lighting conditions. I think the times in which flash is gonna be really needed just got less. Yep. So it's, it's, it's gonna be in those extreme environments when you're trying, you're on a trip, the light isn't great, and you're really trying to make something out of, out of the scenario that you have in front of you, and you still need that flash to balance the light out. But when I'm home, I would just not shoot that day. I would just go out the next yep. day or when it's better light. So I think basically the new cameras are great. You don't need flash as much, but it's still a great tool. And I think it's still really worth learning how to use flash because there are definitely gonna be times when it could be useful. No, I think that's the perfect summary. In these extreme scenarios where you just can't expose properly, it gives you a clear edge in the field. But for your average image, you just don't need it anymore. And I think that's actually something we both enjoy because as we said, it's not fun to use, but it's definitely a very important skill to learn to be able to use it when you need to use it. All right, guys, did you guess what is the next essential element? It's composition. What I really think of is balance or like harmony. Yeah. So like an image where the elements all come together in a nice, pleasing way to look at, not just the bird, but the bird, the perch, the background, any extra foliage or elements where it all kind of comes together, it appears to be balanced and it looks pleasing to the eye. What do you think about composition, Jan? Well, I think you described it very well when you say it's all about the balance in the image. For instance, if you have a bird that's on the edge of the frame and it's looking right out the frame, it leaves a lot of dead space behind the bird. And 
Typically, that doesn't work as well, or with flight shots, you want the bird to fly into your frame. In the end, you can do whatever you want. You can crop your image whichever way you want, and you can have the bird fly out the frame if you really want to, but typically these images won't be as pleasing to look at and will generally not create the same sort of feel when people are looking at the images, because good composition is really what brings it all together. And Ideally, you develop an eye for it. Like I think you and I, we just look at an image in the field, we try to frame it up nicely already, and then when we crop it, we know exactly how we want to crop it. Maybe the perch going from one corner to the other corner with the bird sitting on the, with the same pose on the perch, so it's all one nice flow. And if you're not sure how to do it, there's a few helpers, for instance, in Lightroom, you can, I think if you press the O button, you can, in crop mode, you can overlay the Fibonacci golden ratios and it gives you a little bit of an idea of where things would be. And typically in my images, I find that the rule of the golden triangle works really well, where you kind of have the bird and like a diagonal of your frame, and then you have two more lines that kind of connect with your subject in the frame and that can work quite well. But I think most importantly it is that you actually think about your composition, right? You don't just go in the field, snap away, and then you get out the crop tool and you crop, 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 chop, 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 and I'm done. And that often doesn't work. So I think thinking about where's my bird sitting, what's the pose, what are the other elements in my frame is really important. And that's another thing really important. So obviously we're talking about sometimes you're, comp you're composing the image in the frame fully if you're a really full frame shot. But these days with all these megapixels that we have, it's really not a bad idea to leave yourself a bit of space so that you can have some room to crop in the digital darkroom. And one other thing I wanted to add was it's not only the things that you want in the photo yeah. that makes up the composition, it's also eliminating or working around things that you don't want in the frame. Yeah. And that could be the way you crop or it could be developing your skill set in the digital darkroom and being able to remove perhaps an unwanted thing that sticks right into the corner yep. of the frame or something like that. So definitely make sure to check out those uh, tutorials that Jan and I have provided in the link up there and down there. I could have pointed in totally the wrong direction. I have no idea. <laughs> what about another key element that's so important? I made a video recently about it. There was a lot of discussions under it. Sharpness. It's one of those things where it can totally make or break a photo. You basically are never going to have a really compelling, super compelling image if the, especially the eye, is not in focus yeah. and sharp. You want to feel that connection. You want to feel like you're looking at this beautiful bird and it's looking back at you. And if the bird's eye is not in focus and it's just a blurry mess, you're never going to have that connection. So you're kind of, you're kind of done before you even get started. However, when a lot of people get started or buy their first really nice lens, they think there's only one element of a great bird photo and it's sharpness. So, you know, bird sitting on a mailbox, sharp, great photo. No, you know, bird in horrible plumage, sharp, great photo, right? No. So it's only one element. It's important, but it's certainly not everything. I think the most important thing when it comes to sharpness and bird photography is shutter speed. Because I think if your shutter speed is not high enough, you're introducing shake simply by having the lens hot in your hand or even on a tripod you need a certain amount of shutter speed to not have the vibration birds are moving birds hardly ever just sit still in front of you where you could have like a one second exposure that will never happen so for me typically i don't like to be below a 400th of a second really if i can avoid it because i feel like even then I get a lot of motion blur, but it gives me a good amount of sharp images as well. Do you have like a go-to shutter speed for sharpness? <laughs> well, um, okay, first I'm gonna tell you a funny story. So when I was first um, getting started in bird photography back in the like early days, I had this like pretty junky tripod and I like never really used it, but I like kind of <laughs> carried it around and pretended like I might use it. And I remember I was taking, the, taking pictures and there was this beautiful, red winged blackbird that was just sitting up on a cat tail and he was calling and singing and displaying and just like amazing. Yeah, nice. So I was like, I was like snapping away pics. And I was like, well, he's just gonna sit there. I guess I'll get my tripod out. So I get the tripod out and I set it up <laughs> and I took some more pictures. And I went home and I started looking at them on the computer and I'm like looking through them one at a time. And I'm like, oh yeah, nailed it. Oh, look at that one. Oh, so good. And then it was like, boom, like, way sharper photo. And I was like, oh, wow, yeah. Hmm. 
yeah, I guess I should use the tripod more often. So <laughs> definitely like obviously using a tripod is super beneficial to getting sharp photos. I think, you know, you or I, other than flight shooting, I basically, I'm always using my tripod. To summarize, shutter speed, the, the, the faster the better, but sometimes you have to make compromises. Anyways, we've said enough about sharpness. Yan just made an amazing video all about sharpness, so check that out if you want to really dial in the sharpness of your photos. And why don't we move on to our next essential element, which I know is one that's near and dear to your heart, Yan. Tell us what it is. The perch. At the minimum, I think we typically have three elements, right? We'll have the background, we have our bird, and we have our perch. And we really want to bring these three elements together. So what we often do if we can be in a situation where it's a bit more controlled, like a water spot or a feeder, we would walk around, find a nice pretty looking perch, and then we set it up because it allows us to control the elements a bit more. We can put it in front of a nice background, we can frame it nicely, maybe have something on the side of the frame and then it goes out to the rest of the frame. And then we basically already envision a spot on the perch where we would want the bird to sit. So we would have the perch, we frame it up in camera, and then we just wait for a bird to hopefully do what we have planned. And that's how we get a lot of these images where you have like a beautiful flowery perch or beautiful mossy perch with the bird just in the perfect spot. I mean, let's talk about some of the like, what things kind of make a nice perch. The thing that I like to think about when it comes to perches is some kind of visual interest. Now this could come in many forms. It could be little flowers, little leaves, interesting bark, moss, lichen, even just the shape of the perch could all add a visually interesting element to your image. And that could definitely take your image to the next level. What do you think? What are some other things that would make like a nice perch, Jan? I think you mentioned most of them. And generally the more alive a perch is, the better it will look or the more interest it will have. But also the harder it is to get the bird onto yes. the perch. If we go from easy to difficult, a dead stick upright is probably the easiest to get a bird onto. Totally. And then a fine flimsy perch with lots of little flowers is probably the hardest thing you will ever try to get a bird onto. So I think that's something yeah. you have to kind of keep in mind as well. If you're somewhere, you're only there for a day, like when we were in Western Australia trying to get some birds, we're not going to go for the most crazy perch we've ever Absolutely. seen because the chance of not getting the shot is very high. We might go for something that's a little bit more easy, like a dead perch with a gnarly sort of look. And then we still get a shot. It's still good. It might not be as amazing as a bird on the flower, but we know we're going to get the shot because sometimes if your perch is too fancy, you might never get a bird to land on it. So I think that's something to keep in mind as well. So let's say you're in your backyard and you have some feeders set up. You can start with a more basic perch and then once you're happy with something there, you can try to then put up something with some yes. little leaves or something like that. So you can kind of slowly advance and get something better as you go. Our next element is also a very important one and it's all about the background. I think when it comes to bird photos, it's one of those things when you get started out, people do not care at all about the background. They're just trying to get that bird in the frame and somewhat in focus. But ultimately you start to realize that the background can really detract from the image. And if you're not thinking about it, it's probably gonna actually take away from your photo. So we want to think about backgrounds that actually add to the photo, that actually make it a better image. Every photo has some sort of background. You can't avoid having a background in your image. So we may as well start thinking about it. Thinking about the background is really the key. You may want smooth backgrounds like I have, or I know you'd like it a little bit more texture in it, but it doesn't really matter in the end what background you choose. But I think the important thing is that you actually choose the background. You don't just mm -hmm. see a bird, you walk straight towards it, you shoot. Because <laughs> even when you're stalking birds where you think, oh, I can't really choose the background here, you can. Because you can actually walk to one side, walk to the other side. You can go down or you can go up. If you have a sky background, maybe you can walk backwards on top of a little hill and get a bit of grass behind. Because I remember this image of an osprey that was sitting on this dead tree. And from the first angle, I was just getting it against the sky and it was really boring. But then I saw if I just walk around to the side, I can actually get this green mountain behind it and I created a, for me, more visually appealing image. One of the things I think that until you've used a really long telephoto lens and you're kind of, you're looking at the world through this sort of like much wider frame, you don't realize that when you're using a massive 
600 millimeter lens, especially with like converters, you're looking through this tiny little window. Yeah. And it means that it's a lot easier to select a tiny little patch of background. So again, like I always tell my clients in the field, look past your subject to the background, yeah. look for something that's a similar tone or a pleasing color palette and line yourself up because with a super telephoto lens, that might mean moving six inches. Yeah. It could make all the difference. So just looking past the subject, finding something that's in even light and that is a color palette that you're happy with and you're gonna be well on your way to mastering the art of the nice background. You actually said something in our discussion about sharpness that leads us into our next element and that's the bird's pulse. Because what's very important as well is that we not only get the bird on a nice perch with a nice background, with the right exposure, in the right light, but we also need the bird to ideally look at us and sit on the perch in a way that looks appealing as well and that shows most of the features of the bird ideally. If you have everything perfect just how you want it and the bird's just looking away from you oh. and you're just like, come on, look at me. Just, and oftentimes I'll do like a little psh, 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 yeah. or something like that to try to get it to look at you because it's the worst when everything is there but the bird's like looking off into yeah, space. Yeah, you're like, just like, hello. <laughs> yeah, and even that doesn't work here. sometimes. <laughs> no, totally. It's crazy. Like sometimes they just will not look at you. But without that engagement, without that eye contact, it's never going to all add up to be a great photo. We've made it through our seven elements, Jan. So I guess we're done, yeah. right? Well, unless there was a bonus element, Glenn, could there be a, a bonus, bonus round? <laughs> I think so. I think there's a bonus round here. And maybe what we're going to call, I don't know, like an X factor. Yeah. We've talked about the fundamentals here, and if you do those seven things, you're gonna have a really nice bird photo. But if we're gonna talk about those photos that you really remember from your portfolio, those ones that are really special, you know, you go on a photo shoot for a day or a week or a month, and there's those handful of images that you really treasure, it's probably something where something kind of special happened. Well, for me, living in Australia, one would be, for instance, having a cockatoo with the crest up versus the cockatoo with the crest down that just looks like a little boring bird sometimes with with the crest up or even the wings up they usually have crazy colors under their wings so you have it with the wings up or with the tail fan suddenly you're getting a really really cool shot because the bird shows like a special feature that you can't see otherwise other x factor things i think of is like really any kind of behavior whether yep. it's like two birds fighting, eating, calling, like any of those things are gonna take the image up to the next level. Everybody loves photos of birds or any animals with their babies. So like little Probably. cute little baby. I think the X factor can even be certain lighting situation as well. If you're shooting totally. into a sunset, for instance, or you're having some crazy reflections, anything that really makes your image stand out from the crowd. The, the take home here is, you're gonna have those moments in the field where something special is gonna happen. Either the bird's gonna do something or the circumstances, and you wanna be mastering your other essential seven elements so that yes. you're ready to capture that super special moment and get the shot of your dreams. Because that moment usually doesn't last very long, does it? It's usually just <laughs> no. a very fleeting little moment. So you wanna That's for sure. be able to nail it when it happens. Well, Jan, Speaking of fleeting moments, I think that's it for this episode. We've talked all about seven essential elements, plus we gave you a bonus round, and I think that'll just about do it for this show. Totally. We really hope you enjoyed the elements, and if you study them and master them in the field, it will really take your bird images to that next level. And Glenn and I both really like coffee, so if you can, support us on the coffee page. And if not, that's totally fine, but please make sure to like the video, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the channel. That will really help us as well, and we totally and really appreciate your support, and we will see you in the next show very soon. Bye, guys. See you next time, everybody.